I was attending college at uh, UC Berkeley. I was in my third year of school and contemplating the, uh, the finiteness of being an undergraduate and what was going to happen in my life. And it seemed to me that uh, the natural progression of studying political science uh, was going to lead me into law. But this was back in the day of the early 70s. And uh, there was a lot of chaos going on in politics at the time. And uh, I think that uh, it, it made me think twice about what I, exactly I wanted to do. And although I did apply to law schools, I must have had some kind of entrepreneurial spirit deep inside of me that, that uh, came out at that moment in, in about halfway through my third year of college because uh, somehow I got a spark of, uh, of wisdom and enthusiasm and created a business in the San Francisco area when I was a junior in college that got, garnered some success. I, I didn't end up going to law school. Uh, I created the business, as I said, right around the end of my junior year of college. And through my senior year, the business grew. Uh, continued running the business for about two years after I graduated. A company came along and offered me a considerable amount of money to buy it from me. I sold it and uh, probably would have been smarter if I took every penny at that moment in time at about 1976 and put it in real estate uh, and done nothing the rest of my life. But I wasn't that smart and I was still, still young and very enthusiastic. And so I used that as a, if you will, stepping stone like everything else in my life to do something on a larger scale. And uh, probably about two or three months later with all my uh, bundled energy coming out of my every pore of my body, I started another business and uh, a couple of years later sold that and actually did retire when I was at a relatively young age for about a year, year and a half and then came back to work again and, and then it's been a series of other businesses, some wildly successful and some not so successful uh, and uh, each one of them as I mentioned before has really been a stepping stone and, and I think it, it really just kind of goes back to who you are, the kind of person you are, if you feel that, that you have uh, the skill set to do something even if you're not very good at it if you put the energy in it's not that difficult to make some kind of a success out of it ask me now was uh, founded about uh, three years ago a little over three years ago it was uh, started by a concept of the big picture wouldn't it be nice if you can ask a question in natural language just the way you normally type things not in keywords or speak things and get an answer from a source of content as opposed to just putting in keywords and getting lots of links and sometimes a specific answer but most of the time either too much data and not not the real answer or not enough data and definitely not the answer and uh, we felt that it would really be very practical on a cell phone because of the difficulty with the size of the keyboards, uh, access to the internet, and so on and so forth. And so we've been on a quest for uh, a little over three years to uh, find technology and develop technology ourselves that could allow us to bring that kind of product to market. And we've been doing it, if you will, somewhat with uh, smoke and mirrors for about three years. We have our own facility in Manila where we have over 100, maybe 140, 150 employees that work full time as researchers and our product is in the marketplace. We have hundreds of thousands of uh, uh, people who've used us and use us and uh, on a daily basis we take thousands of questions uh, mostly in the United States and throughout North America, a little bit outside uh, North America as well and uh, the ones that we cannot answer with some kind of simple automation that's, if you will, sort of keyword uh, um, uh, responded to, then it goes to our agents in Manila. However, we've known all along that that's really not a uh, uh, in the United States a real viable scalable business because no one wants to pay for the question it's going to be ad supported so you're talking about only making a penny penny and a half for every answer that can't cover the cost of a, for Manila so we've been on a quest for a little over three years to develop some of the leading uh, I'll call it semantic web semantic net technology to allow for natural language processing so that you can ask a question in natural language and get a response within a split second from a database uh, with no human intervention. And we have created that product. That's right. Uh, they don't do it through voice, it's all through text. However, the manila part of it is being phased out because as I just said to you, we finally have 
found the right combination of technology to allow us to do this in an automated format. In fact, uh, uh, we are just releasing uh, the first natural language uh, search available in the world today into Wikipedia. It's called Ask Wiki. And uh, in addition to that, we have uh, uh, already released in a very limited form uh, ask the operator so that you can ask a question in text format in natural language instead of putting just a person's name in or a business name and an address you can actually say where does this person live or is this the phone number for that person so you can ask the question as if you and I were asking it hey what's what's such and such phone number and our system understands it because it understands every word within this semantic net every word uh, uh, and and every concept of every word around the word's uh, definition so that it, it has a meaning unto itself in the entire string of words. It's not just looking at one or two words and saying, oh, he's just looking for an Italian restaurant, that they're looking for an Italian restaurant that's located in this city that serves this kind of food and has free parking and so on and so forth. It can understand the entire string of, of the, uh, the query. Actually, it's a good, good, good question. Uh, we originally had uh, college age uh, answers, if you will, here in the U.S., but the cost was, was a little prohibitive. prohibitive. It was uh, over $10 an hour. When we looked at outsourcing it to foreign countries, it became apparent that uh, the Philippines uh, is probably considered the leader in terms of outsourcing uh, American or English speaking work where you need to have someone understand the language quite, quite clearly. Uh, we knew we weren't going to have voice interactions, so that wasn't that important to us, but uh, they are far more Americanized in uh, Manila from the American existence that was there for many, many years than uh, they are, let's say, in India or uh, other markets. Mission is always to make money. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise, okay? Because without making it, you can't have any other mission. Uh, the mission for us is to bring a product that I just talked about to market, uh, to, to create a value for, uh, for us as a company and for our shareholders. And simultaneously, it has to be also for our consumers. So we believe that using this kind of processing, and we can talk about all the different things that it that we can apply it to. It's not just a consumer product to let you ask questions on phones. Uh, we believe that using this technology allows us to offer this value to end users, to our shareholders, and to us who work within the company. Uh, natural language processing for uh, those that may not be that familiar with it uh, differs substantially from the kind of search that exists today because the search, the Web 2.0 that exists today is based upon a structured environment, menus, um, keywords. Everyone knows that, that search engines like Google are driven by specific keywords. Uh, they've, they base it, uh, their search upon an algorithm uh, conceived out of a, a very simple concept. If more people ask with these keywords to see a certain kind of answer that they're clicking on, well, most likely that's the answer that most people want to see. So if you put in those two or three keywords, similar to keywords that other people have put in, they're going to show you a ranking of answers based upon what other people have done. And it makes a lot of sense. However, there is a huge, uh, a huge error in this entire concept. And the error is, is that, especially as the internet has grown and there's so much data out there, some of it accurate, some of it inaccurate, that you can ask a question, you know, we can ask something about first president of the United States, and they can give back 5,000 links. Well, which one of those links is really what, what you want? If I just put first president of the United States, is it do I want to know who the per first president was? Um, was it the Continental Congress? Was it, uh, you know, after that? Uh, what, do I want to know what speeches they wrote? Do I want to know if they were married? I just put first president of the United States. It's going to bring back an enormous amount of information. Wouldn't it be nice to actually say, I want to know who George Washington was married to, or when did he get married? And instead of having to just get everything on, about George Washington that could be God only knows how many links, actually get an answer. So I'm using that as a, a very, very simple uh, uh, extrapolation of what natural, natural language should be able to do. And I think that most people that are uh, in the world of search, of knowledge management, uh, assume that at some point down the line, it's going to be like Hal in the Odyssey, that you're going to be able to talk or you're going to be able to text something in that's conversational in nature, and it's going to know enough about you and understand what you're saying, and it's going to be able to retrieve the content. 
Um, we have actually uh, done something that's extraordinary that no one else in the world has done. And it, this really was it's a very good lesson for business students because sometimes you do something that you think is going to bring one, one result, and in reality it actually brings a completely different result. By setting up Manila the way we did, we thought that it would give us an opportunity to find out loosely what kind of questions people wanted to ask, how much time they'd tolerate an answer to come back, how accurate the answer needed to be, and whether or not they'd even pay for it. What we really weren't thinking about originally was that by doing this and taking millions of questions, we were going to find out something far more valuable, and that was not just the kinds of questions that people wanted to ask, but where the content was that was going to supply the answer. And what we discovered, which is now public information because we've talked about it, is that out of the millions and millions and millions of questions that we've, we've taken, there are only a few sites that actually we need to go to that contain all the answers for these questions. Now that's startling because you'd say, well, there's the whole open internet. Well, that's true. But the reality is, is that there are a number of sites that contain a large swath of information that can answer most of these questions. Once again, a lot of questions fall into sort of a statistical category of whether it's sports or whether it's a general uh, knowledge about geography or history. And they seem to fit a funnel to certain databases that have the information. We have that information. So it makes it a lot easier for us now to use our natural language processing to not have to target the entire internet. We can target very specific databases and as we're doing with Ask Wiki, and we can retrieve a very, very large percentage of answers to questions, which is something that when we first went into this, we had no idea that was going to be an end result. But it's made it a lot easier for us to now have a live product. Well, the competitive advantage right now is that no one else in the world appears to have the, uh, the depth of the natural language processing that we do. So uh, that is a, a, huge, uh, a huge competitive advantage. But let me go back because I didn't totally answer your question about the other kinds of products that we can uh, use with natural language processing. But I think it, 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 uh, it goes directly to the competitive advantage. Uh, natural language processing is, is thought of in the marketplace as the next step for search. Uh, it's called Web 3.0. They call it the semantic web. Everyone's trying to do it, and no one's been able to do it. We don't have the semantic web for the entire net because, as I told you, we've actually used it to target it at very specific sites that, that we feel can answer most of the questions that we get primarily for mobile. Some of it will, will uh, wash back to desktop. You know, Ask Wiki, you can do it on mobile, but you can also do it on desktop. But we are not doing, applying our technology to the entire internet. It's fairly problematic right now, and it's not something that we feel that we need to do. However, we have technology that allows us to be at the forefront of what's referred to as knowledge management tools. These are, are uh, tools that help you to understand language. So the areas that we feel that we have opportunities in uh, would be not just uh, what I'll call consumer search, as I was just uh, discussing, but in areas of um, enterprise and moving data for enterprise. So an example would be is that uh, we are working with one of the largest um, cellular handset manufacturers in the world. They have lots and lots of phones and there's lots and lots of data about how you use those phones. Well, we've used, we have used our technology to integrate into their customer service knowledge base so that we can now allow any end user to gain access or even any of their live operators who do customer service to gain access to any of the content in an instant using natural language. They don't have to go through any sort of structured menus. So if you want to ask, how does this phone, how do I send an email on this phone, how do I make a phone call, all these things now can be answered instantaneously uh, through this natural language query. So we're talking about customer service, which is a huge opportunity. We're talking about basic knowledge management. Uh, most large corporations, and even medium-sized, even small to some degree, corporations in the world have issues about documents that are in storage that, that need to be accessed all the time, either by uh, internally by management or externally by uh, customers. But most of the knowledge that's out there is unstructured. Our technology has the ability to scan documents instantaneously, millions of documents within split seconds, and structure all of the data in the documents by uh, pretty much any kind of slice that we want. We can do it by noun, adjective, we can do it by people, places, things, dates. We can do it by concepts, relationships. 
the technology that we have is so powerful that we can scan a document and tell you everything that you could possibly want to know it's in that document it's way more advanced than the companies that already exist today trying to uh, they call it meta tagging co content and then trying to make associations we already have the built-in semantic net to understand uh, unstructured data so we start with the ability to structure data for companies put things in categories uh, the product's been used for a large publishing company that has um, thousands and thousands of, of articles written in thousands of magazines and newspapers over 25 years. We were able to scan all the, the documents and, and put them in categories of over a thousand categories of information that can be accessed by anyone instantaneously. It was a revolution for them. It was done, being done by hand and with very, very little accuracy. Now it's at the 90% accuracy le level. So that gives you one sense of it. We can take the technology to scan data to discover sentiment. So we can uh, take, uh, the technology is being used for this right now, to scan uh, websites around the world that discuss uh, activity about cars and, and tires. And so we're doing it to monitor uh, conversation about potential uh, risks that tires might be creating somewhere in the marketplace. Why? Because there's a very large tire manufacturer that wants to know if something's happening with a tire they have in the marketplace somewhere in the world, that if someone's putting some information out in the marketplace, they need to know what that sentiment is. Did it cause an accident? Maybe it's not. Maybe it's doing something even better that they didn't know that it could do. So product, product management, if you will, product sentiment. Uh, it can, the technology can also be used for, uh, for helping to target ads. We'll call it target, uh, targeting by optimization. So today, everybody uses all these search engines and they see all these ads. Well, the ads are linked to your query based upon keywords. Uh, doesn't take a genius to stop and think about it that there's a lot of keywords that have multiple meanings. Uh, you know, a perfect example would be um, an instance where a couple of years ago, I believe it was Chrysler, I'm pretty sure it was Chrysler, it's either Chrysler or Ford, I don't remember specifically, but it's one of the, the classic instances of, of when this happened. They were launching a new car and they spent a fortune putting ads all over the internet based upon every time their name came up, whether it was Chrysler or Ford. And unfortunately, just when they launched the campaign, exactly the same time, they came out with, I believe, very, very bad earnings. And so for the next two weeks, there was just very, very negative discussion about them all over the Internet. But every time that their company name was mentioned, their ad showed up, which obviously wasn't appropriate, and it was a huge waste of money, and it was a, a disaster. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll use another example, is that people can talk about products and blogs, and they can use derogatory words, or they can use very positive words. Unfortunately, keywords don't pick up the derogatory or positive. So you may refer to a particular product, and that company says, hey, every time they mention it, I want to sell something else. But you actually may have said it's a terrible product with really nasty language. Our software can understand that. What's important about that is that advertising has a, a very, very finite percentage of click-throughs. Uh, that are based upon the way that they're optimized right now. Everyone knows that if you put an ad in this scenario with these kinds of keywords, there's, there's a relationship of the kind of uh, click-through uh, um, uh, percentage that's going to happen. We believe that we can, well, actually we don't believe, we know because we've already done it in, in a, a demos already, that uh, our software can help optimize the targeting of ads. It's a huge difference because uh, it means that uh, for us, if we can increase by 5%, 10%, 30%, or 50% the effectiveness of, of ads on the billions of impressions that are being placed every day. Uh, it's a huge asset for uh, the advertising industry. So there's, there's other, lots of other products that are related to using uh, natural language that, that are all really part of, of categorization of content and sentiment understanding of content. And there's many, many different industries. But for us, because we're a relatively small company still, uh, we're very targeted on delivering consumer content in the mobile format. We're very focused on helping to deliver um, uh, customer service, uh, desktop, and mobile format as well. We were starting to get a lot of calls uh, uh, right after school where kids were doing homework with us, which didn't, didn't matter to us. But we then started seeing that, especially when we started targeting college students, that we were getting a lot of very sophisticated questions that had to do with uh, finite subject matters that you really don't see in generalized search. And uh, yeah, of course they're using it for that. 
it's no different than going, it's really interesting because it's really no different than using conventional search. It's just that we make the, the uh, reply much faster because we give you the answer. In conventional search, you've got to put it in and then you've got to go find the answer yourself. Uh, most students will tell us, well, what's the difference? You just, I was going to find the answer anyways. I knew where it was. I just had to go find it, but you guys actually brought it to me. So it doesn't seem to be any different. I, just, I actually think that because I'm not that big on testing and so on and so forth in schools. I don't know if that's the smartest way to, to make people productive, but I actually think that, that the, from what we're seeing internally, that there is about to be a change that is so cataclysmic in terms of transference of knowledge that what we have seen happen with the Internet pales in comparison to what's going to happen over the next 10 to 15 years in terms of m making content more accessible because it's easier to reach the content. You, if you think about it, for this just a moment or so. If all the questions that you had during the course of a day or the course of a week that you needed to search on the internet, if it didn't take anywhere near the amount of time to do it, the information was much easier, easily uh, received at your fingertips, let's say even on your phone, uh, the fact of the matter is, is that you'd have far more wisdom in your brain. The, more, the easier your access to, to knowledge, the more knowledge you retain. It's sort of a no-brainer. And we see it already with our technology that is happening internally. It's almost uh, scary to see the results of our Ask Wiki in the beta form that we've used it internally. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's eerie because it gives you tingling up your spine because you think on the one hand, how could someone be, there must be a person behind this. How did they answer this sophisticated question in one second? I've never seen anything like it, but at the same time, it's allowing you to access content and understand things so much better that it changes the way we we receive knowledge, and um, it's not today. Just ask Wiki is only one part of it. But in 10 years from now, where every site you go to on the web, you will use this kind of search mechanism. It's a whole different world, a whole different ball game. Let me, let me answer it really succinctly. What's going to happen is those that were going to be slackers. It's going to help facilitate them to get more knowledge faster. Truth is, they're still going to be slackers. But those that excel, the neurotic Nellies of the world, who do rise to the top, it's just going to be a tool that's going to make it easier for them to rise faster and harder. What happens is, is that every new technology that gets advanced, I mean, people don't want to admit this, but it's the reality of technology. It's that you look at what you can do on, an, on the computer right now. It's almost staggering. I mean, even, even 10 years ago in my business, we weren't even sending email, but we were using the internet a little bit. It was nonsense. It's so staggering because it's creating every single day this bigger and bigger divide. I get employees that come in here every day. They realize that if they don't have this skill set to be able to do the things that everyone else is doing, don't even walk in the door. And there's a lot of them like that. They just can't get over the hump. And so what it's doing is it's creating a bigger cultural divide. It isn't a matter that it's saying to the slackers, oh, you can be lazy. What it's saying is, is that they're going to stay slackers unless some of them seep through and say, hey, I got more knowledge, I want to use it. But what appears to be happening is that the more knowledge you get, the faster you get it, the more you rise to the top. Why is it that industries like technology, uh, like telecommunications, advertising, why is it that all of a sudden, you know, people haven't stopped to think about this, why is it that you walk into every major company that I go to, and the people I deal with, they're not 55 anymore. They're not 45. They're 30. They're 25. People think, oh, they're just getting rid of the old. No, they're not. It's that my 26-year-old, 26 26-year-olds 26 who are in that room right there are 100 times smarter than you about telecommunications. They came out of college with so much more knowledge than you and I will ever get, because these are the ones who reached out and took what Google offered them, not just Google, but all the other technology and they put it in their brain and they use it. Oh, absolutely. Uh, although in some ways it's sort of, sort of uh, humorous that they're actually better versed about some of our cultural things here, especially sports. Uh, they actually are more into some of the American sports than we are here. And uh, we, uh, we were providing the back end uh, uh, sports answering of questions for ESPN for some time and uh, it was quite interesting because they were they were better equipped to do it than I think we were here but at the same time uh, there are certain things that that when someone learns English as a second language and they don't live in the country that uh, there are nuances to the way natural language questions come in 
that there's a, an assumption that the person hearing the question or seeing the question understands it based upon the cultural bias of the country that it comes from. And we've had some issues, but uh, quite honestly, uh, the employees in Manila are phenomenal. They're all college uh, graduates. They're wonderful people. Um, they love America, American culture. I just don't know about America. They love American culture. And uh, it really hasn't been that difficult. It's been interesting to, f to find where the gaps were in the cultural divide. But by and large, I'd have to say um, it really hasn't been that big a problem. I would say that uh, more than anything, they have a, a great work ethic, and, uh, and it's probably made it easier on us as Americans because we don't see that so much anymore, so it makes it a little, little easier to manage. I'm not quite sure that the skills are that different. I think that, uh, that there's some basic kinds of personality traits that one probably needs to have, doesn't have to have. I mean, we've all gone into businesses and you've ordered a sandwich and the owner was behind the counter and he basically had no ability to look you in the eye or have a conversation with you, didn't seem excited about his product, and yet you still bought a sandwich and he stays in business. And he might have a, a, a pretty good business, fairly viable. Uh, good chance, though, that he doesn't have lots of locations, good chance that he's not wildly successful, simply because he probably wasn't able to convey himself into the product, not just to the end consumer, but convey himself into the product. And so I think that uh, uh, first and foremost for, for potential entrepreneurs, uh, not, just, and not just going out on your own, but even working for a company. I mean, I, I have had thousands of employees in my some 30 odd years of running businesses, and the ones that always ri rise to the top, uh, it's really the ones that are uh, the most motivated, the most diligent, uh, not necessarily the smartest, but the ones that, that can use the smarts they have to their optimum potential. You know, I started in college. I think that I probably did it somewhat a little bit out of fear because I didn't really want to go to law school. Didn't know what else I was going to do. Uh, but I think looking back on it, understanding myself now, uh, a lot better now than I'm, you know, 30 years later, that A, you have to have a number of traits to be able to pull this off. A, you have to have a good sense of what it takes to relate to people. If you don't have that, it's going to be difficult because uh, it's not just convincing your customer to buy your product, but convincing your employees to work with you, convincing someone to lease you a location, convincing someone to give you some money to, to, to be your partner. Um, there's so much wrapped around personality that uh, if you really don't have much of one, it's going to probably be pretty tough. You're probably going to have to do it on your own or hope that you've got a wife who understands that, uh, that uh, you need a good, uh, a good support system. But I think that the personality is a big part of it. And I, and, uh, I, I venture to say that uh, most people who go into business probably don't look at that first. They probably get excited about an idea, but they don't want to come to grips about who they are and the kind of person they are. Uh, and I, I think that's probably the first thing that you need to get a grip on. The second part is, aside from whether you have the ability to communicate with people or not, is how driven are you? Are you really the kind of guy that can show up every single day? Every single day, and not just at opening time, but before opening time. Are you willing to spend after closing time involved in your business? Is your business sitting in your head 24-7? You can't let it overwhelm your life, but the reality is, is that the people that I've met in my life who uh, have succeeded really beyond the normal uh, uh, goals that any, any reasonable person would have set are all so into what they do. It isn't necessarily the particular business, but they're so into what they do, the process, the people, the product. They live it and, and they breathe it. And if you can't do that, then you're not going to get up out of bed every morning and open up at 8 o'clock. I've been telling my employees and my kids that you know, half the battle is just showing up. And I don't mean that literally just showing up at 8 every morning. What I mean is, is that if half the people are motivated enough to show up every day, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, then you're going to have a successful business. You don't need everybody to be that way because you can't get everybody to be that way. But if you can get most of them to, you're going to succeed. Because um, the easiest business, I've said this for 30 years, the easiest business to open up in America is a hamburger stand. Why? Because Americans like hamburgers. There's nothing wrong with selling something that everybody else sells. It's not that difficult to do it better. I don't have a problem going to a place that isn't McDonald's. I'm sure most people don't as well. But all you got to do is set up a nice place that's in a nice location, that's clean, 
the prices are reasonable, the hamburg just has to be okay, it doesn't even have to be unbelievable. We all know that because everyone eats less than that every day. And you have to treat your customers right, but you gotta show up every day. And it's not just showing up at 10 o'clock when you say you're gonna open, it's showing up bright-eyed and bushy-tailed. If you can do that, then combining that with a personality that can actually communicate with people, get people to see the cause and effect of what you're doing with them, then it's really not so difficult to be in business. I mean, those are two very big things, but it's really not so difficult. And I happened to turn the TV on the other night. There was a thing on, I don't know if it was, a, it was a, an infomercial or whatever, but it was Donald Trump talking, and he was rambling on about a lot of nonsense and pretty much promoting himself. But in, in about 30 seconds, I heard him say one thing, and it's very, very true. Uh, and when I meet people that don't have this ability to impress me with this, I know that they're not going to be successful. There is almost nothing in any business that I've ever run that I didn't know about the business. I make it my business to know everything. I can't manage everything. I'm actually very good at delegating, but that doesn't mean that everything that's important to me, so that if you ask me anything particular about my business, we're a public company, ask me about an SEC filing from a year ago, you ask me about a product that we launched today. If I can't really look you in the eye and make you feel comfortable that I know something about all these things, then I shouldn't be here, at least running the business. And the employees that rise to the top are the ones that rise right with me with knowledge about the business. They know as much, or maybe even more than me, because they're in a very, very finite area in the company. But if you don't have that, that skill set, that ability, that, that inquisitiveness, that interest, that ability to retain, that ability to, to put it in perspective, then once again, good chance you're not going to be very, very successful. No, and I, it's funny, uh, most of, uh, most of uh, my really great employees are very, very, especially nowadays, you know, with, uh, with cell phones having to have uh, schedules built into them, uh, everyone runs around with Outlook in their, in their whole life. Everybody is so focused on 10 minute, 15 minute, 20 minute in intervals, and they can be so much more productive now because of the, the digital world. I'm a little old fashioned like that. Uh, I have, if you see on my desk, I have lists. Uh, I'd still do it by hand. I mean, some things I put in the computer, but not a lot. Um, I'm very, very good and very facile with my mind. I'm very good at remembering a lot of projects that I have to work on. Uh, I have done this for 30 years. So for me, I know how to prioritize what's important to me and when I need to get it done. Uh, for someone starting out, I, I would really say that uh, it's probably very important because decision making is the most crucial thing that you're going to need to do, even outside of managing people, that you get yourself organized from the get-go. Get yourself a schedule, but understand that the schedule is really not based upon things to do. It's based upon things that are important to do because I have a thousand things I could be doing right now, and I'm not doing them because they just don't have any value in my day. Doesn't mean I won't get to them, but they have no value now. So uh, I may be different than other people in the sense that, yes, my day is scheduled. Yes, I'm one of those nuts that when I travel on business, people say, how many meetings do you have in a day or what are you doing? And uh, if I'm going to New York on business, uh, even though I may be tired and getting late and I have to wake up early, because I'm only there for three days, I will work from literally 7.30 in the morning till 10 or 11 every single night and figure out how to get as much done in a shorter period of time so that I can move on to the next thing. Um, extremely organized from that standpoint. But, but I, I have to say that my organization is based upon priorities. It's not based upon what I need to do in a day. I mean, there are certain things that are far more important than others. And it all comes back to decision making. So I think it's really good when you're starting out to get yourself really organized. Uh, but once again, organization is, doesn't replace motivation. The fact is, someone's got to get you up at 8 in the morning, and it really shouldn't be an alarm clock. Uh, I, I tell people this, and I think people are stunned by it. I haven't used an alarm clock to get me up for anything for, I would say, probably the better part of 15 years, maybe 20 years. I have a clock in my room, but whether it's a 6 o'clock in the morning flight or whether it's a 9 o'clock meeting, I don't use it, and I know I don't have to use it because my mind is so finely tuned to what I need to do. that We've all been there, but if i got a flight at 6 in the morning, I'm going to wake up at 4. <laughs> no one needs to tell me to wake up because I'm into what I do. Of course. Um, unfortunately, I run a public company. I say it unfortunately, not that I don't like doing it, but unfortunately, it's, uh, our business is uh, 365, 24-7. 
and uh, being a public company, we have shareholders around the world, we have business opportunities around the world, so uh, it's not unusual for me. Um, I, don't, I may have even mentioned it to you earlier that someone called me at uh, 5.50 this morning and made like it was 7 a.m. West Coast time, and it wasn't. It was 5.50, and I knew it was 5.50, and I hadn't gotten out of bed yet because I knew that I really didn't need to be up till about 6.25 right before the market opened. Uh, but I, I do business 24-7. I have a cell phone with me 24-7, uh, and uh, two nights ago I was working on a deal with Australia that we just announced that went to 3 or 4 in the morning my time, and it, it never ends. But once again, you pace yourself because of priorities and decision making, so maybe then I will sleep a little later the next day or something, but no, it's, yes, it's 24-7. And anyone who's into their business, if they can't apply themselves 24-7, and never going to have a good business. But that doesn't mean that you can't also go take a vacation and relax. You can't go away for three hours and go play golf or play tennis or have a good meal with friends and turn your phone off and survive. Because if you can't do those things, you're not managing everyone else around you well. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> I, uh, I like to say my father did not give me a million dollars and tell me not to lose it. Uh, that wasn't the way I started. I started as a college student and uh, somehow put up probably in my first business, maybe, I don't remember the exact amount, maybe a couple hundred dollars, which was a lot of money in 1973. I got um, a couple of friends to give me a couple hundred dollars and started a business. And fortunately for me, I literally made almost all of my investment back in the first day. And um, uh, evidently, uh, I was a risk taker, but not that big of a risk taker, uh, which says a lot about the other things that I've done since then, because I think it's sort of true about me that I've tried to mitigate my risk substantially. And, uh, the first real big loan that I got, it's actually very, very interesting. I uh, took on a partner after about a year and a half of, of my business with a, a very good friend of mine from college. And we needed to raise, I think it was $1,800. This is probably about 1975 or so, which was a substantial amount of money for a small business that was making a little bit of money, pretty much paying salaries. And we went to uh, was uh, an old bank in San Francisco called Crocker Bank, I think it was. I think they eventually got bought by Wells Fargo. And there was their biggest branch on Market Street in San Francisco. And my, my partner and I, we, we got ourselves dressed up and we got a presentation together. And we had, we had no assets. We had nothing really that anyone should have ever given us any money for. And we walked into every single bank downtown and everyone just looked at us like, you don't, you don't have any assets. There's no way we'll give you money. And we finally walked in and the branch manager sat down with us and he listened to us and he said, I love you guys. He said, you remind me of someone who came in here you know, 10, 15 years before, the same kind of story, and I, I loaned him $1,000 and now it's actually, it's, um, uh, it's a very famous business in San Francisco. Like, it's not Pier 1, but it's like Pier 1. It was, I think it was called Cost Plus or something like that. A very famous sort of warehouse import kind of thing in San Francisco. And this is how the guy started. And he said, you know something? I haven't done one of these in 15 years. I'm going to write you the check and give you, give you a shot. And that's how we got our first loan. But it wasn't without going into many, many, many banks and humiliating ourselves and getting thrown out. But uh, when you're 21, 22, you really don't know any better. The enthusiasm was there. And we just kept doing it. And from there, it just kind of went up. Probably, the, I'd say the biggest challenge is, is really me. The biggest challenge is um, knowing what I really want to do with my time. Uh, I was very fortunate in that uh, a few years ago, about eight or nine years ago, I sold a business for a lot of money, you know, a very substantial amount of money to a public company and uh, was in a position to not have to work again the way most people think of work. And I didn't really work for about two or three years, actually about four years. And uh, I was just turning 50 at the time and came to the realization that I was sort of slipping away from all the things that I was because I was now associating with a lot of older people, older than myself. And I lived in a, what I would call a beautiful sort of retirement community in Florida. I know that sounds really old. I'm not that old anyways. Uh, uh, the bottom line was is that uh, I think just my natural inclination to not want to let myself slip away from being involved in whether it was understanding numbers about a business or understanding marketing or advertising or developing a business, I got myself back into the game and uh, uh, probably didn't do it the way that I should have if I really thought about it. It sort of evolved and just happened. And uh, now here I am six or seven years later uh, running my second public company. 
uh, and I'm in a position where I can take a shot at some of these higher risk opportunities. Um, but I think that for me now at uh, 55 years old that I'm, I'm at that point where as much as I enjoy what I do and I, I wouldn't want to change anything, but I think I have to look a little further down the road and think about how much time do I want to commit to doing something like this because when I do it, I commit all. And so I would say that the obstacles, the, the biggest challenges have never really been the businesses. Every business has the same you know, trials and tribulations. People come to me and say, oh, I've been in a business that, that had uh, um, uh, products that were perishable. It's worse than what you're in. No, I've been there. Uh, people tell me, oh, I've, I'm in products that are seasonal. You know, clothing, let's say. No, I've been there. I've done all of these things. And guess what? There's really no difference. There's a process for all of them. And in the end, if you can't create the product that satisfies yourself, your investors, and your consumers, you got nothing. I don't care what it is. I don't care if it's selling fresh flowers or if it's uh, selling food. It doesn't make a difference. And so um, for me, the challenge really is not the process. It's not the product. It's really about myself, understanding myself. And I think it goes back to what I said to you earlier, that it's very important for someone uh, to take the knowledge that they have. You get an MBA, it's great. I mean, you really should have a very, very good competitive advantage because you've been taught an awful lot that, that takes years for people to learn. I probably didn't know what you, most of these people know after, until after 10 years of, of, of business. But at the same time, um, I just you know, went through every brick wall that was in front of me without really thinking about it a lot. And when I started to think about it many years ago, who and what I am, I realized that, that I had certain kinds of quirks, certain things I like to do, certain things I don't like to do. And now that I'm older, they're even more defined. And, and I think those are the issues that you need to deal with to be successful. Because if you understand yourself, then going into a business that is going to have problems, and they all do, when you hit that first wall, if you're not in a position to go through the wall or figure out how to get around the wall or over the wall, then you should never have gone in to begin, to begin with. And it's not fair to yourself, to everyone around you, to the money that you committed to it. It's just not fair. Well, I'd say that, uh, you know, it's probably been, um, just like I was referring to a minute ago, it's probably been sort of the life cycle of, uh, of things, meaning that when I was uh, 22 and 23, I had very little experience in finance, so it was difficult for me. Uh, when I was 30, I probably didn't have a whole lot of experience in, um, in fact, I didn't have a lot of experience in running multiple retail locations. That was a challenge for me, hiring better management, stepping out from being a mom and pop to being a, a larger organization. Uh, when I was, uh, let's say, 45, it was managing a business that was doing millions in revenue, something that may have just happened to us very quickly, but didn't, I didn't really understand the dimensions of what it meant and the opportunities it gave me. And now it may be that uh, there are certain parts of being a public company that I, I don't maybe have enough experience in because I haven't done it that long, only for a few years. So it's not any one thing. It's really more a result of where you put yourself at the time that you're evolving a business. So I call it sort of the life cycle. And um, to me, if you don't have those kinds of issues where you're really stymied from a management standpoint, then you're not growing your business. Because if everything's easy, that's a problem. It shouldn't be easy because your business is never going to get to the next level and the next level and the next level if it's easy. It just isn't that way for everybody. I think it goes back to some of the simple kinds of things. Personality. Do you have the ability to communicate with people? How do you make people feel in the work environment? Of course, it, that, how do you make them feel it isn't just a matter of giving them pizza for lunch and paying them well. It's do they feel that they're contributing? Do they feel that there's a reward for the contribution other than monetary? And most people uh, you know, talk about how you have uh, um, uh, compensation plans and how important it is, but the reality is, and I think most people know this, that it really comes down to being successful with employees of, of putting aside the money issue and getting them to feel like they're part of something, getting everyone to feel like what they're contributing makes an impact on the company. If you do that, you treat people with respect, it works. Probably what's the best experience to understand about what customer service should be like and what you would want to emulate, go to about 20 different service companies. Go to some retail stores. Go buy things. 
See how people respond to you. See how they make you feel. At the end of the day, just write some notes down. Wow, this person at Starbucks looked me in the eye and treated me really nice. But at the same time, they kind of were pushy trying to, to get me to upsell something. Did I like it or did I not like it? This person at Macy's was completely ignorant of what I wanted. They didn't even care. They were helping other people. The service was crappy, and I don't mean it literally about Macy's. I'm using it figuratively. I uh, don't want to get any problems here. Uh, do that. If you really want to be a smart business student, don't just listen to what's on these tapes and look in the books. Go out with your eyes and your ears open. Every single day of my business life, I interact with somebody every day, whether it's to get a burrito for lunch or whether it's to talk to my wife in the morning. It doesn't matter. I interact and I look at everything. I look at when I go in the store, how clean the shelves are. I look when I go into a store and see if the employees are paying attention to me, even though they're not my employees and it's irrelevant to what I'm doing there. But I look at all these things because every one of these things tells me what customer service should be about. It's interesting, I was just making this comment the other day, now obviously I'm running a, a very high-tech company and, and uh, everybody's got Blackberries and you know, communicates through the internet and so on and so forth and email. Uh, what I find is very interesting is that I was running a public company, this will say a lot about my communication methods because I haven't necessarily changed but the marketplace has and I've had to react to it. Um, three or four years ago I was running another public company that I would say on average, it had a lot more shareholders, a little more developed company, but I would say that I probably took uh, 100 emails a day and anywhere from minimum of 50 to maybe 100 phone calls a day. This company, I take uh, twice as many emails and just a few phone calls a day. Almost no one calls anymore. It's not me doing it, it's the marketplace. Investors, shareholders, customers, everybody communicates digitally. So whether it be by email or whether it's by instant message, it doesn't really matter. The fact of the matter is, is that there's very little voice to voice. To me, uh, it's okay. I mean, it's not the end of the world. But, uh, and I'm not old fashioned to say, boy, it would be nice just to talk to someone on the phone because you can be just as productive communicating with them. I mean, now you need to be real good at words, at, at manipulating words because you don't have the ability to look someone in the eye and convince them with your gesticulations and your vocabulary. You really have to do it with hitting them concisely in, in, uh, you know, through the digital format. So I think it might be a little bit tougher, but at the same time, uh, I think that you can reach so many more people so more effectively, uh, so much more efficiently that it's not surprising that it's happening. And I think that in five years from now, guys like myself who are running public companies will find that you barely talk to anybody. It's just, it's, it's a rare occurrence. Not surprisingly, actually, I saw something on AOL this morning that there was a quip there about uh, did you know, was it AOL or Google, was one of them saying, did you know which country asked the most sex questions? I don't know, but we got a lot in America. <laughs> I'll, tell you, I'll tell you that. I, I did want to look at that because I was kind of curious. Uh, you know, uh, from the mobile experience, it's, it's a little different from desktop because uh, people uh, out and about with a mobile device are very specifically, in a lot of cases, looking for a targeted location, a specific person or place or thing. And uh, that's peculiar to phones. That's not necessarily what you do on a desktop. Uh, but as we've allowed people to ask questions in greater depth with natural language, uh, we have seen that uh, from the desktop we get, I mean from the mobile, we get a lot of questions that are more about your personal life than uh, non-personal. Where's a marriage, where do I go get a marriage license? Uh, how would I do this? And these are things, you know, certainly this is my cleaners open to such and such. These are things that, that are really pertaining to you specific. A little different than what we would see on a desktop. Uh, probably uh, the most peculiar thing, the net of the most peculiar thing that people ask isn't necessarily the sex questions, but it's the fact that they feel comfortable asking us questions that appear to be rather personal in nature. I, I have this guy I'm dating, his name is Johnny such and such. Do you think I should marry him? Should I wear a green sweater today? What does it mean that I've, I've been wearing you know, black pants for four days? Should I talk to my friends if they go out to a bar and I don't want to drink with them? These kinds of things. Yes, the sexual questions can get disgusting and bizarre, but that's okay because that's, everybody has an interest in that, and so that is what it is. But uh, I wouldn't call they, they themselves what's really weird. What I would say is the fact that people feel a connection that they actually want to share something about themselves with what I'm calling an inanimate object. It's just the phone. It's just the search mechanism.
Yeah, we are, and that's that's actually very uh, problematic to you know to try to answer uh, uh, because the you know there are really no definitive uh, content databases that have an answer for should I wear a blue sweater today. I mean, it's really subjective, and so we'll we'll probably soon launch uh, sort of the uh, what's it called the crazy eight ball, the one that you know you just roll it over, you ask a question, you get a a silly answer. We'll probably do that sometime soon because we've got a lot of those questions and a lot of silly answers. Well, for me, uh, I have found that uh, I'm, I'm a very high energy person. And uh, uh, I don't, it's not so much that I don't need so much sleep. Uh, I don't need a lot of uh, away time from the business to refresh myself and recharge myself. So for me, it's, uh, it can be something as simple as having a really good lunch and just not talking about business. Uh, I play a lot of sports activities. I have my whole life. So whether it's uh, tennis, or whether it's golf, uh, no more basketball, but uh, whether it's working out in a gym, uh, I do these things regularly, frequently, probably uh, not enough at some times and probably too much at other times. But I would find that I would say that probably 95% of the time that I'm doing these kinds of things, even just going to movies with my wife on a regular business, on a, on a regular basis, excuse me, consider that a business, I guess, <laughs> uh, on a regular basis. Uh, I, I find that, it, that I'm able to turn things on and turn, the, turn things off. So that's something that I think you need to do. You need to, it isn't what you do when you, work away from, when you walk away from your business, it's the ability to turn things off. I have a lot of stressful things that, that could bother me to no end. Uh, and it's easy to have probably smaller things pick at you than even bigger things. But the trick is being able to turn them off. And I go back to an awful lot about uh, you know, personality traits and about how you learn how to manage people and manage your time. Uh, if you learn uh, quickly, and this is very important for students to learn, if you learn quickly that more complicated and big decisions should be made by being patient, and taking your time, and let, let them evolve, then I think you'll find that you don't have as much worry about them. If you think that everything needs to be resolved the moment that it comes up, then these things are going to burn a hole in you all the time. They're never going to leave you. And uh, the most difficult um, uh, problems to solve are the ones that require immediate action. And the reason that they're difficult, whether it be uh, about anything, well, employees, money, doesn't matter, products, they're more difficult is because generally you have less information. Less information yields. A, a more likely bad decision. It's just the way it is. I can have all the hunches in the world, but the fact is is that most of my quick decisions that I have to make require me to go to bat for them a thousand times harder than a decision that took me a long time to formulate. The ones that I take a long time to formulate, everyone else is on board because they've all come to the same agreement. But the ones that I have to make fast are the ones that I have to convince everyone else because not everybody else is in agreement. They may have more information than me. And those are the most difficult to make. And I think that, that if you look at you know, how you operate your business and you look at you know, how you function away from your business, it all relates to, to understanding how to make decisions, you know, the right decisions most of the time. Everybody makes bad decisions. But sometimes a, good, a bad decision, some good comes out of it. Um, no, I'm not real good at remembering titles of books and, and uh, authors, and part of the reason is because I read uh, very, very fast, and I probably have read um, uh, probably five to ten times more than the average entrepreneur who's in the same position. I am probably way more than that. Um, I can only tell you what I'm reading now, but I've read just about every single uh, management book that's come out in the last 15, 20 years. Um, some of the ones that actually, uh, that, that, and I'll tell you some of these I'm reading now, which I think are great books, but... Um, some of the things that actually interest me are books that have more to deal with um, not so much uh, the normal course of decision making, but more about uh, the psychological part of decision making to be more, more informative to me because they, they let me look at myself and understand myself a whole lot better. And I think that the life cycle of, of going through, I've, I've run many, many businesses, started up just about every single one of them on my own. And so each one is obviously a stepping stone, a learning point. As I said to you, each one poses different problems because things come up that I may have a, I may have a standard way to solve the problem, but they're different problems and they require a different kind of, of, uh, of knowledge subset that I may or may not have. So it seems to me that if you look at uh, 
uh, if you look at reading things, you know, you don't read a book. I never read one book that it's the end all and this is going to change my life. I just don't because they don't. And I would say that probably um, now at my age, I'd say probably 95% of what I read is malarkey or I already knew it and I've already gone through it. And it's, it's okay maybe for someone young to read, but I would also say that and I know someone may criticize me of this, but I would say that if I was an MBA student, the last thing I'd be doing is reading a lot of those books. Because um, the truth of the matter is, is that it's just, like, it's just like your parents sitting there and lecturing you. You don't need to hear it that way. Go do it. Go do it. Get beat up a little bit. Just don't make every decision hasty because you're going to run yourself out of business quick. And guess what? By doing it, when you come back and read those books when you're 35, 38, yeah, I know that. I knew that. Well, of course you know that. How do you think they figured it out? They figure it out the same way you're figuring it out, but you can't just read a book and get an answer. Well, you know, personally, it's always, uh, you know, when you can first dunk a basketball and, and of course, um, you know, convincing a woman to marry you and staying married for 30 years and, of course, actually having your kids like you when they reach 20 years old. Those are all great accomplishments. Um, but... Uh, yeah, I'm just one of those guys that, that's um, not sentimental, not emotional. Um, my wife and I are both that way. We both, uh, actually, it's interesting about us as a couple is that since I met my wife at Cal, we have both run businesses together simultaneously, co-owning and, and working with each other. And even right now, I run this. My wife started three or four years ago after she came out of retirement, a, an unbelievably successful chain of women's shoe stores that's all over the country now. Uh, she's in one of her stores here in Southern California today. and and. Uh, I don't think that you can do what we've done if you're the kind of person that gets emotionally attached to what you do. Because I've sold businesses that literally, that I've had for six, seven years, that literally within 48 hours, I could barely even remember anything about it. I was on to the next thing. Uh, and so by telling you that I am not emotionally attached to things, it really says to you that I don't really put any value on any one thing over another. Just everything's a grand ride. I live my life like this and try to kind of go up like this. I don't live it like this because that's the chaos that doesn't allow me to perform. And um, if you live it like this, yeah, there's lots of great things. I mean, everything's great. Kidding me, I had some Chinese food last week. It was unbelievable. I mean, I've had Italian food recently in a couple places. It was unbelievable. It was the best dinner I ever had that I could recall in my life. It was great. Why wouldn't it be great? I'm alive for that moment. I'm breathing. Uh, you know. God only knows when, I'm gonna, when it's going to end. So to me, um, if, I, if I was to give you any business uh, events, uh, I guess I'd have to say probably my greatest feat was uh, starting a business from scratch that I sold you know, eight or nine years later for many, many, many millions of dollars to a public company only because I didn't have it in my mind when I set out to do it. And so it was, it was a result of it. And that's always a great sense of accomplishment. But by no means was that anywhere near the greatest business feat that I've done. I've done some things that were so good, it's unbelievable. And I've done some things that were so stupid, it's equally as unbelievable. Uh, I own a very successful chain of uh, flower shops in Northern California in major malls. It was actually one of the largest flower, retail flower operations in America. This was uh, in the um, mid 80s. And uh, uh, the Stanford Stadium, for st next to the Stanford campus, uh, the Stanford University is, they were having a football game at the end of the season, some 80 or 90,000 students packed in, and the winner of that game was ostensibly going to go to the Rose Bowl. And so because I was in the flower business, although it was in November and, and, and roses were very expensive to get, I, I cut a deal with the university because I actually had a store in a shopping center that Stanford University owed, owned, and they allowed me to go in there and sell individual roses that I paid about four cents a rose in those days. This was a long stem, beautiful rose, so it tells you how much market was in the business. And I tried selling, I, brought, I bought um, about 50,000 roses. And I thought if I sold, well at four cents each, if I sold them at a dollar, you know, if I only sold 10,000, I was gonna come out pretty much okay. And uh, I, I brought in about 30 of my best friends and we had these huge boxes with the roses. We stood at every entrance, we walked around. We tried to sell the roses and I think by game time we had sold like 500. And this obviously was going to be one of the most unmitigated disasters of my lifetime. And what made it even worse was that once the game started, my 30 friends went in, left the roses sitting in boxes, and just went and watched the game, sitting on steps watching the game all the place. So here I was stuck with, and this is pre-cell phones. I mean, there was, there was no way to communicate with any of these people. So here I was stuck with 50,000 roses, 
and I, I was pretty sure that I was going to lose a bit of money on it, and I was not feeling real good about it. And then I started watching the game, and the game was going on, and then I all of a sudden realized that there was a good chance that if I sold the two dozen roses when everyone left the stadium for a dollar, for people that, whose team won, good chance they might buy them. Sure enough, right near the end of the game, I was able to get all of my silly friends together and promise them a great deal, a dinner, if we were able to pull this off. We covered every exit at the stadium, and then literally the next seven to eight minutes that everyone left the stadium, I sold all, whatever it was, you know, 5,000 bunches or 2,000 bunches of, of uh, roses uh, at a dollar each. Got all my, must be a couple thousand dollars. I got all my money back, and when it was all said and done, I took everyone to dinner. We had $35 left at the end of the whole day. Now, it was a complete disaster because I really envisioned making $25,000 that day, which in 1985 or 86 was quite a bit of money. But uh, once again, I miscalculated that uh, people going into the stadium not knowing whose team was going to come out the winner really had no interest in buying the rose. I wasn't smart at the time to understand that, but I quickly realized that when they left the stadium and they could buy two dozen roses for a dollar, that it was a good deal. And so I came out okay. No, because those are the most fun things that I've ever done. I mean, uh, you know, the, the things that are, that, that are the most challenging are always the most rewarding. You know, the decisions actually that you make that are very, very calculated and, and risk averse because you've taken a lot of time to get to them, they actually, to me, don't feel as satisfying as when you had to pull the trigger on something that required gut feeling and whatever knowledge you had, and then they didn't work out, but you made them work. You got the best out of it. And to me, that's, that's always been the most fun because on a daily basis, running a business, you know, when, you, when you've run one for 25, 30 years, there's really not that much of a challenge. I mean, you know, you, you're really helping people make decisions. And if you've set up the, the format for them to do that, oh, there's good with bad. You always got to weed some out. But you have, like I said, you have certain expectation, level, uh, expectation levels. And if they're being met, um, it's okay. I mean, you know, you go on. I, you can't worry about every little detail. But I would say that, that if I look back on my career, probably, the, as I said to you earlier on, probably the, the thing that I would have tried to have done different was when I was probably about 30 years old and I had already made a lot of money, I probably would have tried to have looked deeper in myself and understood what it is that I, I would have been better at doing for the next 10 years. And when I was 40, probably the same thing to look at 50. And now that I'm 55, I can look ahead and see what I want to do for the next 10 a little clearer. And that's not easy to do because when you're young, you're, a lot of energy, you're just pushing through the wall all the time, and then you get married, you have obligations, you have kids, you're running here, you're running there. You really don't get the chance to, like I said, read books about psychology, read books about sociology, understand the dynamics of how relationships work. I mean, how do you use power? How do you, you know, manipulate people? That's what this is all about. And so by learning that, you learn something about yourself. And in the end, you'll find out what you like and what you don't like.